In the beginning of Acts chapter 8, we see persecution arising and the believers going to various places because of the persecution that took place. And so they begin bringing the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. And then Philip goes to Samaria in the next part of chapter 8, and he preaches the gospel. And the people believe and are baptized. And then the passage we'll read this morning, the last part of chapter 8, Philip has an encounter with a man from Africa, with an Ethiopian, and he preaches the gospel, and we see the gospel going from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, and now to the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Kandike, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. May God bless the reading of his word. We are introduced to Philip in Acts chapter 6, verse 5, when he is chosen as one of the men to help in the distribution of food to the widows. Philip then becomes an evangelist and a missionary. In Acts chapter 8, verse 4, we see Philip going to Samaria. And he proclaims the Messiah to the Samaritans. And the Samaritans believe and are baptized. And then the passage we read this morning says, An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. And so Philip obeys the leading of the Spirit. As he started out on his journey, he meets an Ethiopian eunuch. He's an important official in charge of the treasury of the queen of the Ethiopians. And so Philip meets him on the way. This person is a treasurer of the queen, and he's an important official in Ethiopia. He would be similar to someone who would be called secretary of the treasury. He's in charge of all the money that goes through the queen. He's on his way back from Jerusalem, where he has gone to worship. And he's sitting in his chariot reading the word of God. The spirit again nudges Philip and tells him to go near the chariot. And so as he goes near, he hears the Ethiopian reading the word of God. And so Philip says to him, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I unless someone explains it to him? This is the passage he was reading. 
He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before his shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. It's the famous passage from Isaiah chapter 53 that talks about the Messiah as a suffering servant. It's a prophecy of the Messiah who was going to come and to suffer. Jesus became the sacrificial lamb. Later in the New Testament, we see him not as the lamb, but as the good shepherd. And so the eunuch says to Philip, tell me, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? The Ethiopian wasn't living in Israel. He wasn't aware of all the events that had taken place. And so our passage says, Philip began with that very passage of scripture, and he explained the good news to the Ethiopian. He explained to him that the Messiah has come. He has come to bring salvation, not only for the Jews, but for people from around the world. The way of salvation is good news for people from everywhere. Through the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, salvation is available to all. As they continued on their journey, they came to a body of water. And so the Ethiopian said to Philip, what would prevent me from being baptized? Verse 37 in some manuscripts say, Philip said to him, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And the eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And so the Ethiopian gives orders for the chariot driver to stop. And they get down and they go into the water. As they come up out of the water, the spirit of the God comes again and takes Philip away. But the Ethiopian continued on his journey with joy. Salvation had come to him, and so he was full of joy. Philip goes to the Sumerian, Samaritans and he preaches the gospel. And then he goes and meets an Ethiopian. All these people who were Gentiles, who were outside of the normal scope of people who were those who understood God and his ways. Philip then appears at Azotis, and he continues preaching the gospel and eventually ends up in Caesarea. We meet him again in Acts chapter 21, verse 8, when Paul stays with Philip and his four daughters who were prophets. And so we encounter him once again. He's still in Caesarea, and he's still preaching the gospel. Let me just point out this morning a few things that I see in this passage. The first thing is that Philip was open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Two weeks ago, we celebrated Pentecost, the coming of the Spirit to the church. Philip was open to the leading of the Spirit. Three times in this passage, we see the Spirit speaking and Philip obeying. Verse 26 says, an angel said to Philip, and so Philip obeys and goes to the area where God was directing him. Verse 29, the Spirit tells Philip to go close to the chariot, and so he obeys. And then verse 39, we see the Spirit actually taking Philip away to a different place. Philip was chosen to help in the distribution of feeding to the widows because of his strong faith and because he was open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. He continued to be led by the Spirit as he worked as an evangelist and as a missionary. He had a passion for reaching those who were on the outside. He continued to be led by the Spirit and was led to meet an Ethiopian and preach the gospel to him. Max Lucado, in one of his books, talks about the cultural distance between Philip and the Ethiopian. As Philip encountered this man from Ethiopia, there was a cultural distance between them. The Ethiopian was African, and Philip was a Jew. The Ethiopian was black, and Philip was white. The Ethiopian grew up in Africa, and Philip grew up in Israel. 
The Ethiopian was rich, and Philip was a poor missionary. The Ethiopian was a eunuch, but we're told that Philip had four daughters. There was a cultural gap between them, but Philip, led by the Spirit, went to the Ethiopian and preached to him. He did not hesitate to go to someone who was outside of his normal scope of relationship. He preached Jesus to him, and eventually he baptized him. Philip was open to the leading of God's Spirit. The second thing I see in this passage is that the study of God's Word leads us to light and to understanding. Verse 28 says, after going to Jerusalem, the Ethiopian was spending time reading the book of Isaiah. He was looking for the truth. He was seeking the truth. Philip asked him in verse 34, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian was not so proud. He was willing, humble enough to say, explain it to me so that I can understand. So when we spend time studying God's word and listening to the preaching of God's word that we grow and become mature in our faith. A number of studies have been done over the years trying to determine what's the best way for a group of Christians to grow and become mature in their faith. And almost every study comes back to the same answer. We grow in our faith when we spend time in the study of God's word. And so the Ethiopian was studying God's word, trying to get an understanding. The final thing I see in this passage is that the gospel is for all. The gospel is for Jews and for Gentiles. The gospel is even for Africans. Philip preached to the Samaritans. He was called by God then to meet an Ethiopian on the road. God sent Philip on special mission outreaches to people who were on the outside. Our passage said Philip began with this very passage of scripture from Isaiah and he explained the good news to the Ethiopian. Who is the person outside of your normal family, your normal place where you have relationships with that God is calling you to preach the gospel to? Who is the person maybe you've been taught to hate that God is now saying, go to that person and preach the gospel? What can you do to bring the love of Jesus to somebody who is maybe outside of your normal group of people? The Message Bible paraphrases Ephesians 2 in this way. It says, he tore down the wall we used to keep each other at a distance. Instead of continuing with two groups of people separated by centuries of animosity and suspicion, he created a new kind of human being, a fresh start for everybody. Christ brought us together through his death on a cross. The cross got us to embrace, and that was the end of the hostility. Max Lucado in commenting on this verse says, the cross of Christ creates a new people, a people unhindered by skin color or family feud, a new citizenry based not on common ancestry or geography, but on a common savior. That same book, Max Lucado talks about his friend Buckner Fanning. Buckner Fanning was a soldier in World War II and he was assigned to Japan shortly after the dropping of the atomic bombs. And so Buckner was touring through the city that he was assigned to. And as he toured the city, he saw the destruction that had taken place because of the bombs. He saw buildings that had been destroyed. He saw bodies that had been burned up because of the radiation. But as he toured the city, he also saw a signboard for a church. And so on Sunday morning, he decided that he would go and attend that church. And he wasn't sure how he was going to be accepted. He was certainly aware of the hatred and animosity that had developed between the Japanese and the Americans because of the dropping of the bombs. But he decided to go to the church. As he entered into the church, he was afraid of the way that he would be accepted. 
But as soon as he walked in, he was embraced as a brother in Christ. The Japanese Christians welcomed him to their worship service. And even though he didn't understand the Japanese language, he decided to stay for the worship service. And he was invited to come forward for Holy Communion after the service. The Japanese Christians welcomed him as a brother in Christ. Even though there was hatred between the Japanese and the Americans, he was welcomed as a brother in Christ. Brothers and sisters, there are 6,000 tribes, people groups around the world that haven't had the opportunity to hear the gospel in a way that they can understand. I've been working with Christian Reform World Missions with Resonate Global Mission for many, many years. Over the past 20 years, the thing that we found most difficult is to get new people to come and to join us. We have positions on the books in Nigeria for more than 20 years where our people in recruiting here in North America are trying to get people to come and to join us. For 20 years, we've been crying for people to come and to join our mission effort in Nigeria. And we haven't been able to find the people to come. We've continued to recruit, continue to go to places where we might present the opportunities, but yet we're finding it very, very difficult to find people to come and to join us. Psalm 67 says, May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. David Platt, in his commentary on that passage, says, God intends for his blessings to be spread to the people of the world through us. God has given us the gospel in order for us to spread the good news to all the peoples of the earth. As Philip was open to the leading of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit led him to Samaria, and then he led him to an Ethiopian. He brought the gospel to him. What if you told God that you were available? What if you told God that I'm ready to do whatever you want me to do? What if you said to God, bring me people that I can preach the gospel to or send me to those who need to hear the gospel? John Piper, in one of his books, talks about his friend, Pastor Rajish. Pastor Rajish was a pastor in India and he was working in a very difficult area, an area that was very spiritually desolate. Pastor Rajiv preached the gospel faithfully over the years, but his congregation continued to dwindle. He was losing members, and he wasn't able to gain any new members. He was discouraged, wondering whether it was time for their church to close down. Then he was invited to a conference on evangelism and discipleship. And so he went to the conference. He went discouraged and at the end of his rope. But he was hoping for some new ideas. And so he was encouraged and refreshed during the conference. And there was one thing that he was encouraged to do. The speakers at the conference said, when you go back to your village where you're serving, the one thing you need to do is to go to a neighboring village. And when you go to that village, the first person you meet, say to that person, I've come to you in the name of Jesus, and I'd like to pray for you. That was the instruction that Pastor Rajesh was given. And he was cynical. He was skeptical. He didn't think this was going to work. He had tried various things over the years, and nothing seemed to work. But he was at the end of his rope, so he said, okay, let me give it a try. So when he went back to his village, he asked God to use him. And so he went to a neighboring village. And he met a young man walking down the trail. And he said to the young man, I've come to you in the name of Jesus, and I'd like to pray for you. And the young man said, I've never heard the name of Jesus before. I'd love to hear about him. But let me invite my friends to come so that all of us can hear about him together. And so he invited 25 of his friends, and they gathered at this young man's home. 
And Pastor Rajesh explained the good news about Jesus. Within a few weeks, all 25 of them became believers. And as they became believers, they said, Pastor Rajesh needs to be our example. He came to us and he promised to pray for us. So let's go to all the neighboring villages. Each of us go to a different village and do exactly what Pastor Rajesh did for us. Piper goes on to tell the story that within a couple of months, churches were planted in 115 different villages in that particular desolate area of India. God wants to use us. The word of God is powerful. And when God sends us through the leading of his spirit, he promises to bless us. We can go in confidence knowing that God is with us and he has led us to preach the gospel to the people from around the world. Let's pray together.